Today's Bible reading is taken from Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 17. It's found on page 1077 in your pew Bibles. So that's Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 17, page 1077. Okay. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. But today, we're coming to the end of our series about God, knowing God. And we've been looking at attributes of God. We've been looking at how God is God the Father, He's God the Son, He's God the Holy Spirit. He's the three in one. We've also looked at how God is potent, how He is powerfully effective and able to do what He sets out to do. We've looked at how God is real. He is the most real thing in this universe. And today we're going to have a look at how God is life. So, let's pray before we go any further. Heavenly Father, we pray now, not just to kick off the sermon, but we pray so that we can connect with you, so that we can make sure in our own minds that we're fully attentive to you, that even if we're unsure about you today, we're reaching out to you, We're looking for signs of you, for you to demonstrate yourself to us. So help us to be on the lookout and be listening to what you say to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. 
Now, you may have noticed that we've come to the end of a series, but we're in the middle of the book of Colossians. And that's because we've been looking at the attributes of God from the book of Colossians. And then from this point on in the book, Paul goes on to write to these people about how the attributes of God can be applied to the attributes of their daily living. And so if you want to continue on, you can read through Colossians, just keeping in mind all of those things that we have learned so far. But we come to this key section of the letter, which is sort of a pivot point, where Paul is moving from the attributes of God to the attributes of daily living. And a way of doing that, that he uses, is that he talks about things we must do. This is a list of imperatives, so let me go through them for you. He says, set your hearts on things above, set your minds on things above, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You must rid yourselves of all things such as these, anger, etc., etc. Do not lie to each other, clothe yourselves with compassion, bear with one another and forgive, put on love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, be thankful, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, admonish one another, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right, so... There's a lot of imperatives there, a lot of, you got to do this. And remember, when the Bible says, you got to do this, it's not simply saying, you got to do this, because if you don't do this, if you don't eat your veggies, you won't get your dessert. It's not that kind of, you got to do this. It's the kind of, you got to do this, because this is the stuff that leads to life. That's why there's so many imperatives in the New Testament. You must do this. Because it's saying, this is the way to experience the life that you saw in Jesus, the life that you want. So there's this big long list in these 17 verses. And so I thought it would be good to point out that when we look at such a list of imperatives, we understand that this is a dangerous list. And it's a dangerous list for two reasons. And here's the first reason. This list is dangerous because if we get legalistic about such a list, we are destined for failure. If we get legalistic about such a list, then we are going to experience failure. If we decide, I'm going to legally hold myself and everyone else to this list, if we think that if I legally uphold this list, then these things will happen, if it all becomes about legalism then it's going to end up in failure. Chapter 2, verse 23. Remember, Paul has only just said, just before this chapter, he says about legalism, he says, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. There's a problem that some people may read such a list as all of these imperatives and think that if I do these things then I'm going to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have God's power in me. And so the equation in their minds is this. Good deeds leads to righteousness. Good deeds leads to righteousness. That's what happens when we come and look at these things with legalism. But I ask you, in a kingdom where it is by grace that you have been saved through faith... And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. In a kingdom where that applies, is that kind of framework correct? Is that way of thinking, good deeds leads to righteousness, correct? Well, Paul puts it really clearly in Galatians chapter 3. He says, Again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? Or is it by you simply believing what you heard? Is it by your good efforts or is it by believing God's good efforts? Legalism is dangerous to the new life that we have in Christ. God doesn't give us new life because we are good. We are good, we are able to be good because of the new life that God has given us. We are good, that is, we are all sorted with God. Everything is fixed. Everything is reconciled. Our relationship with God is sorted out because of the new life that we get through Jesus. This is called justification. The theologians call it justification, that we are declared right with God 
because of what Jesus has done and we believe in that. And we are becoming increasingly good, increasingly changed because of the new life that he has placed within us and because of the presence of his life in us, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that process of being made more and more right in how we live and behave and think is called sanctification. Justification is when we are declared you're right with God because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. Sanctification is when we are being made right more and more in how we live and behave. So, if we think that good deeds leads to righteousness, that is a very dangerous way to think. But then there's another way of thinking about this list, which is equally dangerous. Number two, it's this other way is dangerous because, or this list is dangerous because when we get gracious about such a list, we are destined for transformation. When we get gracious about such a list, we are destined for transformation. And God's transformative power is the most potent power in this universe. It is incredibly dangerous to the things that are destructive to human life. The correct way to read this list is, because I have access to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, I can do this. So the equation goes, Christ's righteousness leads to my good deeds. Christ's righteousness leads to my good deeds. What Jesus has done for me in giving me new life actually leads to good deeds. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the more we recognise the Holy Spirit in our life, the more we will be shaped to be like Jesus. The more we look at this list and think, I can do this because of what Jesus has done for me, then we will be shaped to be like him. Because grace is dangerous to our old life. Legalism is not dangerous to the life that you had before you knew Jesus. Grace is dangerous to the life that you had before Jesus. If you want to do, as Paul says in this letter, if you want to put to death the old, then the best way to do it is through grace, trusting in the grace and the power of God himself, not ourselves. Colossians chapter 3 verse 3 says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And the great thing is, you won't find anything except life in God. If you go searching in God, you will not find any death, any decay, any destruction or distortion. You will find life in its fullness. In fact, that's what the Old Testament purity laws were about. The Old Testament purity laws were all about helping people to understand that in God, there is no death. There is no fault. There is no disease. There is none of that. There is no infection. There is no degradation. There is none of that. Now, it seems strange to us, but that's what it was communicating. God was life, and it wasn't normal for anything like death to be associated or to be near Him. And you know what? Even when God Himself in the form of his son, was put to death. He came back to life again. Because God is life. God is to death what light is to darkness. So when you go to God, what he wants is to give you life. But in order to do so, he has to remove death from you. All of the things that smack of death must be taken away. Sin things in our life must die. So don't be scared of humbly going to God and thinking, oh no, what's going to happen? Will he destroy me? No. God is the creator. 
God is the giver of life, what will happen is that God will recreate you. He will actually bring new life about. Just like if you go to a dentist with a sore tooth, the idea is that she'll go to work on the tooth and you'll, your tooth will come out alive, not dead. That's the idea. The dentist is to tooth is death to tooth decay, but life to strong teeth. And God is death to sin and decay in our human lives. But he is life to us because God is grace. And Paul knows that there is only one source of grace. And it may travel to us through different ways and different means, but it all comes from one place. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. This is such a key verse, right in the centre of this book, right in this moment where we transition from who God is to who we are to be, from how God acts to how we are to act. If you're going to understand all the instructions that come in the rest of the letter of Colossians, you've got to understand the transition point between who God is to who we are, and it comes from this particular set of verses. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Is that where your heart is? Is that where your mind is? Is that where your thinking is? Are you still waiting to be raised to life? Are you still waiting? Are you still thinking, okay, one day, one day God will raise me to life. Maybe when I die, God will raise me to life. But that's not how the New Testament talks about things. It's already happened. You have been raised with Christ, these verses say. Raised with Christ. Sure, the physical resurrection is yet to come. That's going to happen a little bit later. Verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. But spiritually, right now, you have been raised with Christ. You have the ability to live the raised life. If you have put your faith in Jesus and owned him as the Lord of your life, then you are completely saved. Verse 3, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You have gone through the spiritual birth canal. You have been smacked on your spiritual bottom and you have drawn your first breaths If new spiritual life as a child of God, you are a new being, a new creation. And because you have this new identity, which is still clothed with the trappings of the old identity, which comes with our flesh, it's actually time to start shedding those things and live like the new being that we have become. And this will happen by the transformation of the way that you think. By transforming how we think. This is the process that the Bible talks about, which has, it has a name for it. It calls it repentance. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Repentance, it comes from a Greek word, metanoia. Meta, meaning change, noia. We use it sort of when you're talking about your nous. Okay? Your mind, change your mind, change your thinking. Repentance is not just self-pity and remorse and con- constant confession. It's not just feeling bad about what you've done. Confession, uh, repentance is feeling glad about who you've become. And too often, if we have a legalistic way of looking at the teachings of the New Testament, we're just going to feel bad about what we've done, instead of looking at it with grace eyes and looking at how fantastic it is that we've become a new being. It's a change of thinking, a change of the mind. Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. 
Now, let's clarify what it means by above, because I don't want you thinking that you go away from here today and you should not be thinking about lunch. You should just be thinking about above. When it comes to Monday, you should not be thinking about going to work. You should just be thinking about above. That's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul and the New Testament has a very grounded spirituality. So let's talk about what Paul means by above, because this, I think, is where a lot of us 20th century Christians lost it. We got a bit confused about this word, and we started to think about heaven as a place that was sort of somewhere out there. It was as though heaven was was disconnected from earth, as though it had no interest in earth except what it could get from it, which was souls. It could just save souls. So soul winning or conversion became the main goal. And the number one question was this, often asked. It was, if you walked away from here today and got hit by a bus, where would you be? Would you go to heaven? Now, frankly, I think that bus drivers have a much broader ministry than that. I think that we need to be looking at this much, much differently. But this was it, wasn't it? Heaven was kind of like, it was connected to earth by this tiny little portal called conversion. And basically the rest of life was about trying to squeeze as many people as we could through that little portal, as well as making sure that you never closed that portal, that you always had access. So a bit of legalism would often creep in. But in fact, when Jesus came, he said, I'm coming to tell you that the kingdom of heaven is here. The doors are being thrown wide open. When Jesus died, the temple curtain was ripped. The curtain that signified the gap between humanity and God. The idea of the gospel message being about conversion alone is just a very small one. The gospel contains that but is so much bigger than that. Chapter 3 of Colossians, verse 9 through 11 You have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What Paul is talking about is not just conversion, he's talking about transformation. He's talking about the big change. He takes up Jesus' message of heaven coming to earth. He's starting to talk about Jesus' prayer being fulfilled. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have a new self now and it's growing to look more like its creator. Paul says your new communities are being transformed. Jesus' followers are being changed There's no longer Gentile or Greek or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and is in all. There's transformation taking place. Paul talks about heavenly mindedness, not because it draws us into a dreamlike state that can give us a few moments of bliss as we fantasize about heaven and escaping the earthly state. No, and here's the next point, Paul talks about a heavenly mindedness because that is how heaven starts to infiltrate the world. Through heavenly mindedness, heaven starts to infiltrate our world. That's how it starts to flood in. As people's minds are changed, as people's thinking change, as their worldview, as their core beliefs start to change, as they start to go from thinking of themselves as sinners to saints of being sinners who sometimes do the right thing, to being saints who sometimes do the wrong thing. But they're now saved. They're changed. And they start thinking heavenly-minded thoughts. And when I say that, perhaps it helps to understand that the best illustration we have of heavenly-minded thinking was that of Jesus. As he lived every day, as he interacted on earth as a human being, his heavenly thinking made him look different to the rest of us. And that's what he's drawing us towards. As we engage in the renewing of minds, of our worldviews and our dreams, our goals, our our self-concept, our thought processes, we start to be changed. It affects us, even in the most simple of ways. Have a look at chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You know, I thought it was quite interesting that we've seen this in Hong Kong recently. If you've been looking at some of the footage, reading some of the stories about the protests that have been taking place in Hong Kong, it's been a very peaceful set of protests. And it's quite fascinating. And one of the reasons for this is one of the main leaders of that movement is an old Christian pastor. And he has mobilised a whole lot of churches to be a part of these protests. And they've been doing something very, very simple, which has had a mystifying effect on the crowd. Have a look at it right now. Here's a video of it. There's all sorts of footage, if you look on the internet, different places at different times, of this one song, such a simple song, being sung all over the place. And it's being recognised by the New York Times and the um, BBC and by the Bogota Observer in Colombia, I'm sure. All papers around the world, all these news outlets are saying, this is becoming the anthem of this protest. Something as simple as this starts to transform because when we start to seek peace, the peace of Christ, it has a transformative effect on us. True heavenly mindedness actually connects us with the life of God. Is God worried about Chinese rulers? Is God worried about Vladimir Putin? Is God worried about Donald Trump? Is God worried about any other politician or force in this world. No. And there's a group of Christians out there singing hallelujah to the Lord, bringing heavenly mindedness to a very earthly situation and it has very concrete results. True heavenly mindedness connects us with the life of God and when we encounter the life of God, that life flows into us. This is one of the reasons why I love the story of the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. She goes to the well in the middle of the day when all the other women have left in the heat of the day so that she's on her own because she's an outcast. And she goes in search of water for her physical life, but she encounters Jesus there. She finds someone who actually has water for her spiritual life. And as we watch every scene, she becomes more and more alive until she returns to the town of the people that she's avoided for so long and she's so full of life, she just has to get their attention because God is life and when we engage him, we get life. And this list that Paul mentions in Colossians chapter 3, particularly in verse 5 to 9, this list of nasties that he mentions in our earthly, God-lacking aspects of life come about because of an unwillingness to engage with God and to look heavenward. Have a look at these these things, verse 5 through to 9. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, because these are lifeless things. And the reason for that is because they are Godless things. God isn't involved in any of those things. But when we engage God, when we look heavenward, we find life-giving behaviours and attitudes start to flood into us. 
Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen holy people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, Paul is saying, this, this is who you really are. Verse 12 to 14, this is who you've really been made to be. If you've accepted God's offer to transform your life by removing the old and receiving the new life from above, you are really this kind of person. And perhaps today, you have never really accepted God's life. Perhaps you have realised, I've never really engaged fully with God. Perhaps you've been living off your parents' faith. Perhaps you've been living off your church's faith. Perhaps you've been living off your husband or your wife's faith. And the little bit of life that overflows from their life has been what you've been relying on. But you never say that life is something that actually flows out of you. You've seen it, you've heard it, but you know that you don't have it. And the reason is that you didn't realise that it actually comes from God Himself. It doesn't come from church, it doesn't come from family, it doesn't come from good deeds or clean living or law-abiding You may have done some compassionate, some kind, some patient things in your life, but they come and go. And you know you can only do so much. It takes so much energy and frankly, you don't have an endless supply. It's exhausting. Just exhausting. And God knows that. Matthew 11 verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me. Or you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. All biological life on this earth needs the sun. And all spiritual life in this universe needs the Son of God. Needs Jesus. Have you actually set your heart on Jesus? Have you actually set your mind on Jesus? If you do, you experience a peace like no other that is present even in the middle of all the awkwardness and difficulties and challenges and doubts of life, but is there. Because your life won't actually be hidden from him, your life will be hidden in him. It'll be far away from any earthly threat against it. When you live the with God life, you have all you need. And if that's the life that you want then I invite you to pray with me now before we finish this sermon. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, this morning some of us realise that we have never really engaged with you. We've engaged with all sorts of ideas, all sorts of rules and regulations. We've engaged with church or with other Christians. But Father, we recognise that we've never really engaged with you. What we really want is the life that is so rich and full that it flows into us and then out of us. A life which doesn't rely on what we can muster up, but what you can give to us. And Lord, some of us have realised today that we have never done that, ever. We've been living something else. We've been trying to live a life from below. And what we really need is a life from above. And so right now we confess that wrong-mindedness and we pray, Lord Jesus, I will own you as Lord. I choose to follow you and I choose to put aside the old life that I had and I want to receive the new life that you will give. Forgive me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've engaged with God for fully for the very first time today, or if you've been engaging with God for a very long time in your life, the important thing to remember is that you have new life from God. You have been transformed, and the process of transformation will continue. And so I want to 
mention one last point before we conclude, and it's this. God's life in us and our life in God is not automatic, it is manual. God's life in us and our life in God is not automatic, it is manual. Now, I'm talking about a car here, so you can have an auto transmission or you can have a manual transmission. Now, you know what happens when you've got an auto transmission and you take your foot off the brake? The car starts to move. Okay, it does it itself. If your foot is on the brake, it stops. But if not, if you let your foot off the brake, it just goes. Life is cruisy. But the Christ-born life is not like that. You have a manual gearbox. You have a spiritual manual gearbox. And you have your foot on the pedals and your hand on the gear lever. And God has brought you to life. The engine has revved. (laughs) You have been raised with Christ. The Holy Spirit is fuel injecting your life, but you have to engage with him. You have to put the car in gear. You have to put the car in gear. Yeah, clunk. (laughs) Verse 1 and 2. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. There's going to be times in your life when you are just sitting in neutral. You have got to put your foot on the clutch. You've got to engage. You've got to set your heart. You've got to set your mind. The engine's running. God has transformed you. But you've got to engage. You've got to put in the effort. Remember, the kingdom of God is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. That's that legalism stuff we talked about before, thinking that we've got to earn God's favour. No, no, no. But it is something that requires effort. This is the process of sanctification, of being made right. We cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We need to engage. God made us as humans to do that kind of thing. Next, we have to take off the handbrake. That's important. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, etc., etc. These things are breaks on real life, on the life that God has, the with God life. So start driving like a champion. That is, start driving on the track. That's an important thing. Champions drive on the track. Have you noticed that? That's an important thing to do. Start driving that way. The Holy Spirit will guide you, but you've got to steer. (laughs) Peter Brock did not win as many races as he won because he got to the end of Conrod Strait at Mount Panorama and he took a right and went into Bathurst and went to drive through. No, he stayed on the track. He steered that car in the right direction. Verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness. And finally, after you've put the car in gear, oh, (laughs) yeah, smile. Finally, smile. After you put the car in gear, after you've taken off the handbrake, after you've started to steer, then sit back and smile and make the most of the life that God has given you. Don't drive angry. Don't sit there gripping the wheel. (laughs) It happens, doesn't it? You live the Christian life where you're gripping the wheel. Just take a breath. Have a smile. Enjoy the ride. Let the peace of Christ, verse 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Go ahead and turn the radio up. Verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now, that doesn't mean that next time you're sitting down with a Christian for coffee, you need to sing something to them. (laughs) But what it does mean is there's something about that melodious, thankful kind of attitude to life, which is singing the praises of God which makes a big difference. And, and last thing, drive towards the sun. Drive towards the sun. Drive towards Jesus. Whatever you do, verse 17 says, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
pretty corny, eh? It's a pretty corny illustration, the whole driving thing. But I hope that it helps because I want to make sure that we've got the focus right. Notice how this passage begins and ends. Verse 1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. And then verse 17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is life. All the things we long for are found in Him. God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Life doesn't simply come from God. Life is in God Himself. It doesn't just come from Him. It's in Him. All the desires of our heart are in Him. All our thirsts are in Him. And they are quenched in Him. All our hunger of our soul is satisfied in Him. All our highest hopes, our unfulfilled dreams, they were all directing us to find an answer that was beyond earth, to be found in heaven, when it came in the form of Jesus the Son, sent by the Father, known by the Spirit. As John said in 1 John 5, the Son of God has come and given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true, And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are life. And we recognize right now that it's not actually about the life that comes from you. It's the life that's in you. It's about finding life in you. That's where the secret is. And that's where you placed us. You have placed us in you. You have given us new life in you. New life was never going to be found in some kind of place in the universe, some kind of geographical location. New life is going to be found in you. And so even though we're living on this planet, we can still have new life because you have placed our new identity in you. We are now hidden with Christ, our brother, as your children. We are now filled by your Spirit. So not only is our life in you, but your life is in us. God, forgive us when we've been distracted and we've been looking in other places, even other good places, and we've missed the best place, the real place, the original place, perhaps the only place, which is to be in you. Lord, would you make us more heavenly-minded? Would you help us to set our thoughts and our hearts on you so that we might be of the greatest earthly use that history has ever seen, that this world might be transformed by a group of people who continue to live out of a life which is founded in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, after hearing that, after recognising that life is found in God, then part of the way of accessing that is by worshipping Him and by just enjoying who He is and celebrating that. So as we stand, we're going to sing this last song and we'll take up our offering. And if you're a visitor, it's okay to let the bag pass you by. But let's stand and let's worship God.